he goes into this house. There's there's lightning and thunder, and he enters the house, and then you just have a cello playing itself in the corner. There's spider webs everywhere. There's horrible old house noises, the creaking of the floors, door slams behind him of its own volition, and uh, there's creatures walking around, hooked up on the walls, and the whole time there's this cello playing in the background, just floating by itself, and then ghosts pop up out of the coffin, and they start calling his name in these horrible voices, and you're just left like, oh, okay, this is straight up horror. Disney wants everybody to forget it existed, but that was Disney. That was Disney. Welcome back to the Unreal Craze Podcast. In its first, and in my opinion, foremost podcast on transgressive fiction, internet culture, and everything from 4chan that's actually good. And today, we do have something from 4chan. In fact, we've got a guy from 4chan. Today, I'm being joined by Waxworks, and we're going to discuss webcomics, what they are, who makes them, and how do you do it. But first, you know, as always, I am your host, L.A. Labouche. And as well as Waxworks, I am being joined today by this nice little pipe I picked up in Kenya. Got it as a souvenir, clay and bamboo, and I'm smoking a rum and maple blend, mostly because I got a box free from a guy when I said, hey dude, I want to start smoking pipe, can you hook me up? And he gave me a box of pipe tobacco, so, you know, I'm smoking that. And I gotta say, it's, it's not very good. I don't recommend it. I'll smoke the whole box because I don't want to buy another, but... I will strongly advise, like, go to a tobacconist, get their house split. That's the stuff they smoke. That's probably the stuff you smoke. And if you schmooze them right, they'll even give you a free little baggie to test out. So, yeah, I mean, welcome Waxworks. Thanks for coming on, man. Howdy. Good to have, well, good to be here. I'm not having you, you're having me. That's a mutual thing. So, yeah, you are currently, I'm told, a webcomic writer and sometimes artist. Is that true? Well, I'm more of the writer at the moment. I am learning to draw so that I can do it myself. But uh, I do write a lot. And I did write a webcomic. Currently on hiatus, but it does still exist. Yeah, I've got it pulled up on the other screen. Hagward. It's about this doll creature. A hagwarder, I'm told, that, you know, fights hags. And it's like the last one on a quest to, you know, keep the world safe. Yeah, hagwarders... The Hagwarders comic itself, the Hagwarders themselves are living dolls. There's a lot more to it than just that, but, you know, that's going to be revealed in the comic eventually. But they do fight hags. Hags are creatures that are attacking humans in their dreams, their nightmares. They feed off their emotions. They can appear in the real world while the human is asleep, and they do bad stuff. And so the Hagwarders are out to stop them. Right, right. I mean, obviously, you know, I've read the comics so far, and I've definitely enjoyed it. So my first question then would be, well, what inspired you to come up with this? Because it's a pretty unique idea, especially with the protagonist being, well, it's animate, but normally an inanimate object. Uh, the Hagwarders, that was actually a collaboration between two others and myself. They began the idea, well, the artist began the idea with a simple drawing, and from there it was elaborated upon and i took that and ran with it created a lot of lore for it and okay okay major storyline nice you know that sounds good i've always been impressed by people who can collaborate successfully because frankly i have never pulled it off i haven't done it when i was writing fan fiction and you know the collaboration the podcast fell through because my co-host disappeared off the face of the planet, and now I own the Unreal Press, or at least I'm trying. Okay, I'm, I'm not seriously trying to coup, but yeah, so that has always been something that's very difficult to me, is trying to sync my schedule and share a creative vision with somebody. How are you managing to do that? Um, I can honestly say it's difficult at the moment. The artist needed time, which is why it's on a hiatus. I've got a lot of other things that I'm writing still that I want to work on. Hagwarders is something I would still love to continue with, but without the artist, it's well, it's not happening at the moment. He was under a lot of stress. I can't claim to speak for him, but he needed time, and so we'll see where that time goes. So 
I can't honestly it is working at the moment because it's not going anywhere, but we're trying. He and I still talk, so. I see. Well, thank you for sharing. Yeah, I can definitely say that it is hard to rely on somebody, but from what I'm hearing here, I'm getting the impression that you at least knew the artist before you got into the project. It's not like you posted saying, hi, I'm a writer. Is anyone an illustrator? Do you want to collab? It's like you knew this person already, right? I did. Before we started collaborating, I did know him. We talked. We talked about my writing. We talked about his art. So I knew about him. I knew him before we started the collaboration together. Okay. Yeah, I think that's probably definitely the best way to go through it for most people is try and get into a creative thing with people you already know and familiar with through it and at least then somewhat can trust and rely on. Because, I mean, yeah. when I try to collab, apart from, you know, the Unreal Press venture, which is the current thing, I always found it to be starting to say, hi, I'm a writer and in some cases editor. Is anyone looking for work? And that was very difficult because you always found the most random idiots online. Like guys would say, hi, I've got this million page thing trying to push through Republican politics through ponies or some insane nonsense like that. And you're sitting, thinking, am I really going to sign up for this? And I'm sure there are a couple of people out there thinking, oh, gee, man, it's not this guy again. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a crapshoot. I will agree because you don't know the person. All you have to go by is the art that you can see, what they tweet about, other stuff that they've written that you might have read. And you never know what you're going to get. Since the headquarters went on a hiatus, I have been looking for other artists to work on other things. And I've met a guy and we're working on something else, hopefully. But, you know, with the pandemic and just he had to deal with real life stuff before we could continue this further. So it becomes very difficult. He's a nice guy, though. Great guy. Very good art. But... Being able to work on art and getting a living through art is right, right. hard. Yeah, it's, it's such a challenge. And I think the internet there has really been a double-edged sword. Because, I mean, we met online and you've met both of your artists online, as I understand. But on the other hand, one thing I've found that's so difficult is it creates so much competition. Anyone can make a webcomic. Anyone can write a book and post it on Amazon. Oh, so I think yeah. in that sense... That's, that's what you struggle. see so much stuff. It, like it makes it available to you. Sure. And it's available to everybody just the same. And then you see stuff, just, you see so much and so much of it is just bad. And you just get a yeah. little, you get a little discouraged because like I, I, the, the web comic peg orders, it was posted on tap as tap as the online web comic hosting service. And, you find stuff based on likes, what people like, what people vote on, and say, this is good, this is bad. And as I'm sure you're aware, it's like a lot of people think a lot of stuff is good when, oh man, it really isn't. Yeah. Yeah, I can definitely say that. I mean, I don't have that much experience with web comics. At least I don't have any from a creation standpoint, which is one of the reasons why I brought you on. Thanks for being here. But I can definitely say that from a readership angle, and again, with a lot of other free online content, especially writing, both fiction and fan fiction, how popular a thing is has so little relationship to its actual quality, especially, I think, when you're discussing anything that's more niche. Yeah. That great works often go underground because of that. Like, the, the movie, as an example, the movie, you remember the one with the blue aliens? Yeah. From like 2010-ish, I don't remember the year. But people loved it. But I watched it, and I did not fall into that camp. I did not enjoy Avatar. Like, it was pretty. That was the weirdest movie. Yeah, it, it was pretty. And everybody says, it's like, oh, it's just Dances with Wolves, but with Blue Alien. Just Fern Gully, but with Blue Alien. Really, the only thing it had going for it was the CGI and all the special effects, because the storyline was terrible. Yeah, it was just dances with wolves. It was terrible. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm, from, I'm not from you people, but here I am, and I'm going to save the day, and I'm going special thing that you want me to do. And everybody loved it, but I didn't. And so you'll find yeah, comics. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, you'll find comics where, oh, the art is great, and everybody loves it because of the art, but then you read it because everybody says, oh, the art's great in this comic. Okay, cool, the art's great, but there's no storyline. I don't know, it's such a challenge. I get what you're saying about Avatar, because I saw it as well, and I found a similar thing. 
I mean, the first time I saw it, I was pretty impressed because I wasn't really viewing it critically. I just thought exactly like you said. Oh, look, the CGI is pretty. Oh, look, they're, they're blowing up the, the innocent planet people. That's it's such a heartfelt story. But I mean, the second time I saw James Cameron's Avatar, I was just sitting there thinking, well, shit, the cartoon with the same name is so much better. So, I mean, Avatar the Blue People Edition, yeah, the only thing going for it is the CG. The world building's terrible, the dialogue is mediocre, and it's got this huge, like, white savior thing that really just leaves a bad taste in your mouth when everything's done. A really harsh bad taste, yeah. Like, okay, uh, do you read comics much? I do, yes. Okay, you're familiar with Marvel, DC, Dark Horse, Image Comics? That I am. Okay, so... I don't know how old you are, but back in the 90s, um, what's his name? I can't remember his name. The guy who made Bone. Do you know Bone? Vaguely familiar, yes. Go on. Okay. That's, that's part of the problem, actually. The Bone came out in the 90s, but it was entirely an indie published. This man self-published his comic. He made his own, got his own stuff in his house. He did all the art, did all the writing. And he self-published his comic, he printed out like several thousand, several thousand copies right, of it. Right. And he took it around the country, distributing it, and it became an underground sensation. Unfortunately, you don't know about it. You, you, you barely, you're vaguely aware, you said. Yeah, yeah, I know it's existed, but I haven't read it. It's amazing. I highly recommend it. Bone is fantastic. Oh. And yes, it is just called Bone. Because the main character is called... Bone Bone. Okay. He's a little caricature of a dude. He's, he's, he's a fun fella himself. He's got his two brothers, Smiley Bone and Phony Bone. And they go on this adventure, and it starts out just kind of tongue in fun. But very quickly, you realize, oh, there's dragons. Oh, there's a village. Oh, there's an entire world of normal-looking people where these uh, caricatures go to, and they have this whole goes into this whole dark adventure that I won't really spoil for you. Fantastic, but it's written well. It's got great art, but there's this is an intentional double entendre. It's not it's elating. The characters aren't sexy. Yeah. And they don't have the clout of Marvel Comics or DC or another big name behind them. For a brief time, it was published in, by chapters in Disney Adventures, but they didn't go through the entire thing. Do you even know about Disney Adventures? No, I, I don't. Okay. That's... I, I, like, I read a few of the... Yeah, yeah. go on. Disney, Disney Adventures was this uh, compendium back in the 90s that Disney would release. It had a whole bunch of different Disney-related stuff. They would, like, like, Reader's Digest. Reader's Digest, but for Disney. Okay, okay. And for a very brief time, Bone was published in that, but nowhere else. And so nobody knows That's about the most niche Bone. Thing. Yeah. And he, he became successful about it. In fact, actually, just, just this year, when Netflix had that, just last month, actually, when Netflix was losing stock because of whatever the hell was going on with them. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened with Netflix, but... So when Netflix had, when they had their little thing last month, when Netflix was losing stock, Bone was supposed to be a animated series. And Jeff Smith, that's his name. Jeff Smith, the creator of Bone, has been approached over the years by Nickelodeon Fox, I think it was. No, it wasn't Fox. All right. Somebody else. But Nickelodeon was supposed to have an animated series. And there was one other person. And then most recently, Netflix was making an animated series for Bone. But okay. when Netflix lost stock, they canceled it. And so Jeff yeah. Smith posted a tweet saying, no, I'm out, never doing this again. We are never getting an animated series of Bone. I'm sorry. And yeah, it breaks really my heart. Disappointing. Yeah, it breaks my heart that he would have to go through this so many times and get the shaft every single time. And he's given up now because just can't do it. And he deserves it because yeah. Bone is an amazing story. The writing is fantastic. The art is fantastic. I mean, he did all of the beach bubbles himself, text, everything, all by himself. Wow. And so few people know about it. The mainstream does not know about Bone. Like, I'm sure if you find a diehard comic fan like myself, you'll find that they know about Bone, but it doesn't get the credit it deserves because 
it isn't published by one of the main publishers and doesn't have that quote unquote style that people love. Yeah, I can I can definitely see that from because what, what you're telling me, it's a really unique work and it's definitely something we could use in I think the Western comics industry, which yeah, like you said, it is it's dominated by people and controlled really by so few genres and art styles. There isn't this room to experiment with it. Yeah, like it's not superhero and superheroes are fine. There, there's too many of them. Um, Invincible has gotten a lot of attention. I have not finished Invincible. I've read some of it. Invincible is not for me, but it's yeah. good. From everything that I've seen when the animated series came out, I watched some of that. They did a good job on that. Yes, I definitely enjoyed the animated series. Yeah, it's a good story. Again, not for me, and it's got good art. Um, there are so many Superman things, but comics, All-Star Superman, I enjoyed. I know that's very okay. mainstream, but there, there's stuff that goes unnoticed because it's not your typical superhero fare, and that's a tragedy. Yeah, I found that's definitely the case. Yeah, I've, I've noticed a very similar thing with uh, Western comics, and one place I saw it really hit hard is the horror genre. Because you get excellent horror comics, and hell, you even get some really fantastic and creative stuff, and then you know, you also get stuff that you think, why aren't we doing more of this? Or oh. why aren't we pursuing these ideas? Like, you know, Crossed. I, I found the first series of Crossed to be phenomenal. <laughs> some of the most haunting stuff I've ever read. Crossed, I have very mixed feelings about. I enjoyed some of Cross, but I had to give it up because it eventually went into just dock horror, which doesn't yes. do it for me. I like stuff like yeah. Ice Cream Man. Have you read Ice Cream Man? I have not. Tell me about it. Ice Cream Man is good. They're a bunch of short horror vignettes that are in one okay. way or another related to this Ice Cream Man. One of them, it has this whole nice little pastiche of um, strawberry, vanilla, and chocolate. And a man goes to buy an right. ice cream cone, and the moment he buys the ice cream cone, it goes into this strawberry, vanilla, chocolate. The Neapolitan. Yeah, and the strawberry section is one version of what would happen to man, the vanilla section is another version, and the chocolate version is another one. And the okay. rest of this little vignette is just chocolate, strawberry, vanilla, telling you what would happen. One of them is horrific, another one is pretty mundane, you know, vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry, and another one is another sort of weird. Uh, well, that's a very interesting take on it. And uh, Yeah, and I think that's also just, it immediately stands out to me, that's a great way to tie together the comic's overall theme and imagery with this exploration idea by actually linking, you know, the commonly associated flavors of ice cream that we already have packaged together and then seeing how do we bring this to life and make a story. That's, I'm, I'm actually disappointed I haven't read this yet. Yeah, go look it up, it's good. Everybody has their own expectations for what strawberry, vanilla, and chocolate are going to be and this is a horror version of it, which is very nice. Hmm. I don't even like ice cream when I'd read this. Yeah, I'm not a big fan myself. I much prefer sherbet, but... Sherbet. Ice cream is one of those typical things that people just... Oh yeah, you like ice cream? Yeah, I like ice cream. You're gonna have to explain to me what sherbet is. I'm South African and we don't get that here. Oh, well, sherbet is like... How do you describe it? Okay, do you drink it? No, it's, it's an ice cream kind of thing. But it's less... You know that cream feeling you get in your mouth? That dairy feeling when you drink milk or eat ice cream? Yeah. Yeah. Sherbet doesn't have that, which is why I like it. It's like okay. kind of shaved ice, but not. Right. I don't know. So is it like a like a sorbet? Yeah, yeah. That'd, okay. be, that'd be a good way. Yeah, to I mean, I've had sorbets. I've also had kulfi, which is an Indian style of ice cream. That also doesn't have this that same cloying dairy taste. I think it might be similar to that, actually. I have no idea what that is, but yeah. Yeah, I recommend it. Indian restaurants, often the higher end ones, will have it for dessert. And now, I might get flack for this, but I like flack because publicity is publicity. But that's pretty much the only, like, non Western dessert I enjoy. Kulfi. The rest of it I've found is just. <laughs> just give me another starter at the end of the meal. But back to, like, the issues with webcomics. One thing that I've wanted to know now is. 
what are the challenges with it? Obviously, we've discussed, you know, getting it out there and getting people to read it, competing with the, you know, Marvel DC industry. But what other things did you find difficult when making Hagwars? The first Hagwars? difficulty is deciding where you're going to post. Because you can post it on your own website if you have, if you have a domain. But that leads into problems of distribution because then how do you let people know that your webcomic exists if you have no traffic you're not getting people to see your webcomic which is why we chose tapas okay because tapas is people are already tapas and if you go to tapas you'll get recommendations like oh you have read this what? then you might like this and I if see. you update regularly then you also get priority and if you post elsewhere along with all of this help from the website that it's already getting then you'll get more people looking at it right you can have orders on web too yeah i posted it there as well for the same reasons but tapas was easier because you can schedule posts on tapas webtoon you cannot you have to manually upload things onto webtoons every single time i mean maybe they've updated it since i last checked i haven't been keeping track since the hiatus began but the biggest problem is distribution figuring out how to get people to look at your comic because if you don't have the support from any of the big names you've got nothing if nobody sees it it's not going to get ready yeah i've seen a similar thing with yeah. writing yeah, it's like you almost need to build like this whole brand recognition around your name as an artist and as a creative um, before you can create things. But that's so counterintuitive, I found, because how else do people know who you are? That's more of a modern thing. That's, that's more of a modern thing, uh, the internet related thing, because people will follow artists that they like these days. Like you can easily find an artist and just chase that person. But with comic and other things, Jeff Smith, the creator of Bone, had to go around to Benchon and release chapters in zines back in the day. He had to distribute it himself. Okay. And with Marvel and DC, you go to Marvel and DC, you're expecting Marvel and DC stuff. Now, the art yeah. and the writing varies greatly, but you know that you are seeing the adventures and comics that you like. Like, you go to Marvel for X-Men. You go to Marvel yeah, for... Yeah, you're already invested. Yeah, you go to Marvel for the Avengers. You go to Marvel for Doctor Strange, for characters. You go to DC for Superman. You go to DC for... Um, for Batman. Batman, yeah, Batman. I love Batman. But when you go to DC and Marvel, you experience a greatly varying variety of art writing like i enjoyed squirrel girl back in the day okay okay but they release the unbeatable squirrel girl comic series which is a separate matter entirely but that defeats the entire purpose of squirrel girl to give her her own comic but that's uh anyway the writing is okay but my God, I cannot get past the art, the Unbeat Squirrel Girl. It's combined with the writing, it is just completely insufferable to me. And so I have these, yeah. I, I have this vision of Squirrel Girl from when I was reading the Great Lakes Avengers, which was hilarious, by the way. And you get all these tongue in cheek jokes. And you find stuff like, oh, Squirrel Girl apparently, in other stuff, you find Squirrel Girl apparently had a relationship with Wolverine. And it was just like a two-page thing. It's like, oh, Squirrel Girl was in a relationship with Wolverine. Then they never talk about it again. And, and that's, that's how it's supposed to be to me. I see. That is my personal view on that. But then you get the unbeatable Squirrel Girl, which has art that I just cannot reconcile and writing that I just do not agree with. And so if you're going to stuff like that, Marvel and DC brand names, then you're getting this variety. But then you go to Neil Gaiman. You just follow Neil Gaiman specifically. And if all you are following is Neil Gaiman, you just chase him around and read all of the books he's written, the comics he's written for, you're getting Neil Gaiman. You can expect the same quality from Neil yeah. Gaiman. 
roughly. Yeah, it's like that's why I used to, you know, follow him when I was on Tumblr. Same with Twitter. It's like I like the books, most of them. So what every new it's like, okay, if I want Neil Gaiman, I got a Neil Gaiman. That's a guarantee. Exactly. Coraline, the the ocean at the end of the lane, Neverwhere. Oh, oh, American God. My favorite though, the Graveyard Book. That was my favorite one. That's one I haven't read actually. I really recommend it, especially since I know you enjoy the the horror and supernatural aspects of, well, just media. Oh, is, yeah. It's such a great book. Admittedly, it's directed more at a YA audience, but it's also one of those rare few pieces of content that takes itself seriously enough and respects the audience enough that you can get a lot out of it as an adult. It's the story of this kid who is adopted by ghosts and how he grows up literally in a graveyard. That sounds adorable already. Yeah. You know, it, it's got very strong, heartfelt moments as this child interacts with the graveyard and brings this youthful energy to it. And at the same time, how he's drawn into this macabre supernatural world. Yeah, that, that's very Neil Gaiman. Like Coraline was uh, quote unquote directed at young adults, which I do believe it was. But then you actually read it or watch the movie and you're like, wow, that's horrifying. Yeah, no, that, it's one of those stories where, as a kid, you don't have the frame of reference to understand how fucked up it is. Yeah, but you enjoy but it all the you same. You look on it as an adult, and you think, wow, this is, this is serious stuff. Yeah, like, okay, there was this, uh, like, people these days think about Disney. This is a film thing, but Disney, back in the uh, 80s and 90s, had released a bunch of horror and it was supposed to be comedy horror at the time. Well, there's Watcher in the Woods, which is just horror. Yes. Horror sci-fi. I don't know if you've ever seen that, heard about it. I know a little about it. Okay. Disney wants everybody to forget it existed. But that was Disney. That was Disney. And then they released Bride of Boogity. Which, well, yeah. Boogity and then Bride of Boogity. It was a sequel. And Boogity was comedy. Okay. okay. Boogity himself was a ghost. And so you're like, ooh, ghost horror comedy, ha ha ha. And yes, Boogity was horror comedy. But then you get Bride of Boogity, and I don't think Disney quite realized at the time, but it's fantastic, it's horrific. And they're like, oh yeah, this is, this is for children. No, at the very start, a man enters a house, and you're like, okay, if you had never seen Boogity, okay. you wouldn't be expecting comedy. So it's like, all right, he goes into this house. There's, there's lightning and thunder. And he enters the house, and then you just have a cello playing itself in the corner. There's spider webs everywhere. There's horrible old house noises, the creaking of the floors. Door slams behind him of its own volition. And there's, there's creatures walking around, hooked up on the walls. And the whole time there's this cello playing in the background, just floating by itself. And then ghosts pop up out of the coffin and they start calling his name in these horrible voices and you're just left to like oh okay this is straight up horror and then after that everyone's like ha 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 we pranked you good and you're like oh my god and it kind of continues that for the rest of it and that's like wow yes like okay ha ha that onion onion bacon ice cream is brought up later but no that's just horror yeah, I think I'll, for ice cream, if I have to have it, I'll stick to Neapolitan. Yeah. But yeah, thanks for sharing, because I never knew Disney made films like this. Yeah, they did horror back in the day, and they, they want everybody to forget that they did. And you, you don't, like you were talking about respecting the audience, like, all right, Disney, that's great, but now you've released live-action Lion King with these completely emotionless CG things. That was such a shit film. It was. And I'm so wary about the, the Sandman, like, the Sandman comic back in the 90s, 80s and 90s, just amazing. I still go yeah. back and read it over again. Neil Gaiman. Yeah, that, that City in the Bottles issue was, for me, one of the yes. best things I've ever read. Yes. Oh my god, chapter 50. I know exactly the chapter with, with Harun al-Rashid. Yes, the Baghdad. Yes. Oh my god, that is my favorite chapter of all of Sandman. And I, I like, I, I just read it two days ago, again, because that chapter inspires me so hard. It's, it's beautiful. And it is only accomplished. It can only be accomplished in comic. You can't write that. You can't make a film out of that. You can't, maybe you could animate it. Maybe. 
but you can't get that in any medium except for comic. Yeah, it was such a unique thing that really explored the limits of the genre. It was incredible. And I don't even think you could animate it because if you look at the panels, there's this incredible level of detail that almost makes you want to, after you read it, sit down and like spend minutes on each page absorbing it. If you animated that, that detail would be lost. Like at the very beginning, the very first few pages when they're talking about Baghdad, when they're talking about the city of dream, you have the writing and it's sort of divided, but you have him talking about the, the text is talking about how the city is the city of wisdom. And you have all of these different wise men presented one at a time as it talks about them, but the art draws your eye to each thing. And when it talks to the city of wonders, you have the automaton machines, you have the magical bird, and they're just battered across the page like a Pollock paint. And you're just like, oh, are you, are you looking at the text or are you looking at the image? Yeah. And you, you barely even know after you've read it because it just seamlessly goes through it. And then after that, it talks about how Harun al-Rashid is so sad and you slowly zoom in on his eyes and he looks like a normal guy sitting there. And then you have one panel just of his eyes. Dark, sad eyes, haunted eyes. And you just know that this man is not happy despite everything that they just talked about. Harun al-Rashid is not happy. Fantastic intro. Fantastic intro. It's amazing. And I love it. Yeah. That's, that's what comics need to be. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. It, yeah, that, I think media estimate does something unique. When you can read it and say, I'm happy I saw it like this. Because there's no way anything else could have done it better. Yeah. One thing that really stood out for me, uh, another comic, well, I think it's technically a graphic novel, was Mouse. Mouse. I didn't like the story of Mouse, but the way it exploited the media. You're not supposed to like the story. You are not supposed to like the story. You are supposed to read Mouse, and you are supposed to realize, oh shit, this actually happened. Yeah, and I'm just remembered of this, like, the intro, where the, the older Mouse is sitting on this exercise bike as the child asks him, Dad, what's that number on your arm? And the next scene, as he's still sitting on the exercise bike riding it, is shown inside the wheel. It's like the time is spinning back and drawing the past into the present. I just thought, just put it down for a second, I thought, yeah, it happened. Gives you this gravity to the whole situation. Yeah. One, one other comic which, uh, granted, never reached this height, but I thought you might have an interesting opinion on is, what did you think about the MLP comics? My Little Pony comics. I liked a lot they of exist. them. Yeah, I've read, I've read most of them. I did not keep up, admittedly. The ones that were actual little adventures, like with uh, Shining Armor and Chrysalis and all of those, where they go visit Chrysalis while she's in prison and accidentally let her out again. Those ones. Yeah. Those ones are good. Some of the other little slice-of-life stories were, because I can't remember a single one of them, completely forgettable. Yeah, yeah. I think the newest ones, well, no, sorry, the oldest ones, like the Queen Chrysalis one, the uh, Nightmarity one, that was Katie Cook who did them. Yeah. And, yeah, and Andy Price. Andy Price, that's the that, artist. That partnership. Yes, those were good. I like those. They were, they were perfectly fine comics. None of them were really standout comics, but they were very good. I enjoyed them a lot. They were fun. Those ones actually, I really think Hasbro has a very different idea of what their audience is capable of understanding, but, you know, that's a separate matter. Yeah, I always felt with the comics that they occupied this uncomfortable middle ground of, they never had the incredible wide access appeal to the show. I mean, they're, they're not on cable television, obviously. Yeah, they don't. They're, they're comics. Comics have never had the same widespread appeal. Yeah, so as I thought, they, they always seemed a little more mature or serious to me because they weren't thrown at the same little girl audience, or at least the, the people who made them, I thought, realized to some extent, we're going to have a little more niche audience, so let's do these a little more experimentatively. Let's take a slightly more mature view of the world we have, because 
the actual brony fandom is going to be a larger percentage of the readership. Yeah, that comes from the fact that comics have never fully shaken their position as something that young men read. We've never quite gotten away from that. We still haven't. And the movies from the Marvel Cinematic Universe still do not shake that. They've pushed a little bit toward more adults, like older adults, but they still haven't managed to shake the fact that you generally think of comics as something that young men read. Yes. And I've also noticed then with the Marvel Universe that there isn't this back readership to the comics. I mean, obviously, you know, some people will check it out, but not enough to sway a demographic difference. Like, I know hundreds of people who like Marvel Universe, to varying degrees of fandom. A lot of them female, a lot of them, for other reasons, not fitting in the, you know, bro demographic you sell comics to, at least you traditionally did. But those people, you ask them, hey, did you find about this by the film? Have you read the comic? They say they never have read the comic. The problem with that is, why would you try to start reading the Marvel comics or DC comics? Like, honestly, this is an honest question. Why the fuck would you read the comic? Because you have to understand this huge backlog of comic lore. Yeah, it's like getting into One Piece. Nobody does it. Like, One Piece is easy. You go to start at the beginning. One Piece has a beginning and it has an ending. There's nothing in between except for the middle. But you start trying to read Marvel comics and they're, they're falling into this with the movies that they're making these days. They are falling into the same problem that they had with the comics. If somebody wants to start watching the Marvel Cinematic Universe, where do you start? Where do you start? Well, okay, I'd start at the first Iron Man movie. Yeah, but that's because you know that. If you didn't know that that's where it started, where would you start? Like, if, if you... No idea, frankly. If you watch Doctor Strange, like, what just came out? I, I haven't watched it because I can't, I can't be bothered to up. If you watch the latest... I think Doctor the most Strange, recent one was, like, Morbius, maybe? Okay, watch Morbius. And then where do you go from there? Okay, Morbius is supposed to be... Wait, is, is he a Spider-Man villain? I forget. Yeah, but it, even then with Morbius, it's the side story. And granted, you know, it's been memed to death at this point. But like, yeah, it doesn't give you any pointers. There's no saying, okay, if you don't understand this one, see this one. Yeah. This isn't easily available information at all. Morbius, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Morbius, I believe, was originally a Spider-Man villain. That bat guy with the vampire powers or something. Is, is, is yeah, yeah, powers. it's their it's the version of Man Bat. Yeah, he's got vampire powers. And so if you start with that, you watch Morbius, and then you're like, okay, that's cool. Maybe I should go watch one of these other films to talk about it. And then you go to, let's say, Spider-Man No Way Home. Far From Home, or whatever that is. Yeah, No Way Home, No Way Home. Then you're like, okay, Spider-Man was teaming up with the Avengers, so let's go watch the Avengers. And you're like, okay, I have no idea what's happening here. And then you find out about Guardians of the Galaxy through the Avengers. Wait, who's, who's who? Why, why is this tree a tiny tree? Why does this raccoon keep this tree? And then you realize that, oh, you've been watching these out of order. And you have to go back to the first Avengers, then you have to go back to the Iron Man. Who, who would be bothered? Yeah, no. Unless you're really super invested in case, how did you get there? Yeah, and yeah. the comics are worse. Why would, like, X-Men currently has this thing with, I don't even remember what it's called. They're crack, crack, Krakoa, Krakoa. The X-Men live, X live on this meteor, I guess, planet that they built. Who built it? I don't know. And if you want to understand that, apparently they're, they're banning F Franklin Richards from it because he's not a mutant, even though Franklin Richards can be whatever the hell he wants. And they're allowing Mr. Sinister in there and Apocalypse because Mr. Sinister turned himself into a mutant somehow, but Franklin Richards isn't allowed. And... Cyclops, Wolverine, and Jean Grey are in a threesome? They're in a polyamorous relationship with a whole bunch of other people? Jubilee's a vampire? Yeah, it's like you got 40 years of backlog. I'm just, I'm just looking at the Wikipedia page for Morbius now, and apart from being like the highest grossing film of all time, the character was invented in like 1971. Yeah. So if you actually care, good, good luck with that. You got 50 years of comics. Yeah. And Morbius barely shows up in any of them. And yeah, it's, it's like a side character for 90% of it. And, and they want you to go back and start picking up all these comics. It's, it's like 
Japan's version of pop groups. They will throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. Meanwhile, if I want something, if I want a nice story, like, I can go and pick up Sweet Tooth. Are you aware of Sweet Tooth? I am, yes. Okay. Sweet Tooth is a good comic. It's a fantastic story. It's sort of like, well, you know what? I will compare it. It's sort of like The Walking Dead. This weird apocalypse happens, and this uh, man lives in the forest with a child who has antlers. Yeah. And it starts out that way. And let me say this, the art is bad in Sweet Tooth. You understand what's going on, but the artist is not Marvel Comics or DC Comics level. But the art doesn't matter. The art is good. The art tells me what I need to know. Right. Even, let me go back to that Harun al chapter 50 of Sandman. The art is excellent. Well, it's, it's, it's good. It's good art. It's not the best art. It's not going to win any awards for being super ultra real detailed. There are points where Harun al-Rashid's fingers are just little blotches, but that's all they need to be. Yeah, it gets the job done. I, I need to know what is happening. The swooping bird tail as a bird flies across the page, it's a beautiful bird, and I don't need to fuss about what it is. And in Sweet Tooth, the art is frequently ugly, but it's supposed to be ugly. There's a girl who has yeah, a pig for a face. Most apocalyptic thing. Yeah. This girl has a pig's face. And Sweet Tooth doesn't care. The child doesn't care. It's a child like him. He doesn't care. Yeah. And the art tells me what's happening. Some guy's getting shot. Some alligator child is devouring a groundhog child. And that's horrifying. But that, that'll get you into Sweet Tooth. And it gets better the further you go. And I don't need to worry about side stories. I don't need to worry about what's happening elsewhere. I don't need to worry about any of these other characters because the story is self-contained. All of the story I need to know is happening here in these pages from start to finish. Yeah, you read it and then you're done. Yeah. And that's fine. And then when you're done that, if you want to tell a different story in that same universe, go ahead. Like Sandman. Yeah, or potential for a different universe. Yeah, Sandman. I can read, start at the beginning of Sandman from the 80s and read it through to the end. And I have everything. There's a lot of chapters, and some of them seem disconnected. But it's all just built into this universe, the Sandman universe. And there's this new comic coming out with the Corinthian, who is part of the Sandman universe. And I, I worry about it because I don't believe Neil Gaiman is involved anymore. I'm hoping that this new Sandman stuff is going to be good because the writer is a writer that I have enjoyed work from before. Right. But Marvel does not respect its readers, and DC doesn't either, because they expect you to, they're, they're trying to goad you into reading what they have, and I'm not enjoying myself. Yeah, no, it's so disappointing. You'll have new reboots of older properties and everything else, and like, okay, I can't keep up, my guys. I don't want to read about what new thing... I'm not interested anymore. Like, I'll read it out of morbid curiosity, but I'm never going to pay for it. I will, I will read it if I can find it for free somewhere. I am not going to pay to read whatever the hell is going on with Cyclops and Wolverine's polycule on Krakoa. Because I just can't be bothered to keep up with the shitloads of universes that you have going. This is, this is why... The crisis on infinite Earths happened back in the day because they just tried to collapse everything and start over again. Yeah, and even then, they never do it properly. This is why House of M happened. Because Marvel realized that they had too many mutants everywhere. They had too many stories everywhere, and they needed to get rid of them. Yeah, I know. It's hectic. Do you think that's like a thing that most franchises will just run into if they're long running enough? Is that just eventually they'll accumulate this whole dredge of stuff you have to slog through if you want to understand what's going on. Yeah. I, I fully believe that. Because the longer you go, the more characters you get. And it's fine to go for a while. And it's fine 
to continue to have stories in that universe. Stop telling me about the same characters. Wolverine has had more adventures than are even possible for his long life. It gets to be too much. Like, One Piece is, as I said, start and finish. You can go start to finish, and One Piece is just one contained story. Yeah, well, it's not it's finished. It's not finished. Yet. But there are... No, it's still going. There are so many characters. And Oda realizes that you can't tell stories about all of them. He'll give people their time to shine, and then they will disappear, as they are yeah. supposed to. Maybe they'll come back later for a little show, but once they're done, they're done. Like, Mr. Tubon Clay, maybe he'll come back. I don't know. I'm not Oda. But Mr. Tubon Clay had his adventure, showed up in the prison arc, and then he, quote-unquote, died there. Yeah, it's like kill your darlings kind of thing. Yeah, you have to let go at some point. Like, as much as I love and adore Sandman, Sandman, at the end, Dream had to die. He had to die yeah. at the end of that. It was mandatory that he do so. And they were setting it up. Neil Gaiman was setting it up the entire time. Because you talk about delirium, it, delirium didn't used to be delirium. That was setting it up. We go through a story that seems disconnected from the main storyline where we're talking about this entire other dimension slash planet. And that's where we realize that, oh, the Endless can die. Yeah, it's, it's a heavy moment. You realize, oh shit, this is for real. Yeah. There are stakes for everyone. Everybody can die. Death has talked about this. And then at the end of Neil Gaiman's Sandman, Dream does indeed die. Because that's what he wanted this entire time. And this whole yep. thing was him setting himself up to be killed. It really is great foreshadowing. I think that's one of the highlights of it if you read it for the story. Yeah. Like, even my favorite chapter, you read it and you realize that Harun al-Rashid is talking about, this is the best. My city is the best city, and this age is the best age. Yeah, it's peaked. Can this last? Will there ever be any city like it? And Dream can't answer him. This is the best that it will ever be, Harun al-Rashid asks. And Dream responds. Dream, who is one of the endless, who has seen civilizations rise and fall, and has probably been asked this before, answers, it may be so. There will never be another city like it. It may be so. I, can, I can't say. Yes, Allah alone knows all. And Harun al-Rashid, who is only mortal, thinks, okay, maybe there will be. But, but Dream knows that there will be. There will be other cities like this. There have been other cities like this. And even in his acceptance of Harun al-Rashid's request, take my city into Dream. I will give you my city, and in return, I want my city to never die. And Dream just looks so sad. Yeah, it's... Because, yeah, as you see it. The city does change. It becomes the Baghdad of our history. And that's such an impact to think, well, what if it didn't? What if the magic continued? What if it lived this natural yeah, life? Yeah, and yes, the city is still in dreams, but... A lot of other things are also in Dream, but they're not real. And as you've read the comic, you realize that the real things are the ones that we should be focused on. Because they do have an end. And that's respecting your reader. Marvel doesn't let anything end. Nothing ends for Marvel. Yeah, just moat the cow to death. Yeah, we have universes upon universes. The only act you can ever take is to end everything. And you have to. Yeah. At some point, you don't have to end your little universe if it works. If in Hagwarders, you could tell stories about an endless number of Hagwarders and an endless number of Hags. But you do need characters to end, or else they don't matter. Yeah, there's no significance. You always know, well, there'll always be another adventure. Why should I be invested in this one? Exactly. Superman, like, somebody dies in Marvel, you don't give a shit. How many times has Jean Grey died? Shit, dozens. Yeah. Maybe hundred. 
And that, because that, yeah, it has no. Graphics. That's actually a good. You don't care. That's actually a good segue into talking about horror, which which I love. Okay. In horror, you know somebody is going to die. Yes. You expect it, and you can't have a continual storyline of horror very easily. I mean, that's why like those slasher franchises always get so shit. Yeah. It's just the same thing. Yeah, because Jason, you know Jason is going to come back. And that can be used yeah. to great effect. Freddy will always exist and will always haunt our dreams. That is actually wonderfully done because we know Freddy exists. Jason always comes back. Yes. But that's why we forgive these shitty movies. Because yeah, that's what we expect. We're here for Jason. We're here for Freddy. We don't care about what characters, like I couldn't name a single character except for Tommy. I can name Tommy because Tommy was the first one to quote unquote kill Jason. Yeah, the, the accomplishment. Yeah. Sets the precedent. Yeah. That's the only character I can name from any of those slasher films. Yeah, it's like you don't care about the characters. I, I know Laurie Strode, Laurie Strode from the first Halloween. Of course. Because Laurie is actually what Michael is obsessed with. Yes. But that's why Laurie gets a pass here, because Michael keeps coming back and killing other people because he's obsessed with Laurie. The newer films with old Laurie are great. I really enjoyed that. I haven't seen the, I haven't seen the second new one, but I did watch Halloween 2016. I loved it. It was so much fun. It was a fun film. Yeah, it really gets you motivated to see what's happening. But yeah, I mean, that is a thing with horror. You have to accept that things will leave, that there will be an end to things. Yeah. And in, in horror films, we accept that a lot of these things are going to end. But Michael keeps coming back. But Michael isn't a character. It's like a plot device. Michael is a plot device, yes. He is a force of nature. Jason has no character. Jason, you, we know that Jason has weaknesses. He can't swim. Jason's fear is of drowning, but we know nothing else about Jason. I don't want to know anything else about Jason. The moment you explain the horror, it's no longer horrible. Yeah, it just, it just goes away. Yeah. Because then you know the weaknesses. You know Which how to That's why work. horror works so well in things like Ice Cream Man. Because you have vignettes. The common thread is the Ice Cream Man. He shows up and you know it. You're like, oh, there's the ice cream man. Oh, 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 oh. here we go now. Here we go. And you love it because you know that's the trigger. Jason showing up is the trigger. Freddy showing up is the trigger. Michael showing up is the trigger. The moment you see Michael, you know somebody gets stabbed. The moment you see Freddy, you know you're going to hear some ha ha funny quip and somebody's going to die. Yeah. And so how do you feel then about horror in other kinds of media? Because now I know we've discussed comics and we've discussed movies. What do you, what do you think about horror in, uh, you know, writing? Because if I remember correctly, you were involved, uh, you did a lot of writing things on 4chan at some point discussing horror. I did a lot because horror is a genre that I adore. But I also agree that horror is frequently, frequently utter garbage. Horror writing is very hard to do right. Like, everybody knows about Stephen King is the name of horror. But I will get a lot of flack for this. I don't like Stephen King anymore. Stephen King was good before the 2000s. I liked his writing in the yeah. 90s and before the 90s. What I always thought about Stephen King was, Stephen King, this is my thesis that I got off a, a Tumblr post like four years back, is... Stephen King is not a good writer. Cocaine is an excellent writer. Stephen King was a good writer. If you read older stuff, Harry was good. My favorite was Gerald's Game. Gerald's Game is good. Stephen King does better as a short yeah. story writer, actually. Um, Gerald's Game was good. Room 1401? Yes. That one's good. I, I like that one as well. Fantastic movie there, too. What was that, what was that book about the car? Char Charlene? Anyway, the, the book about the car, that's good. A lot of Stephen King's short stories yes. are very good. But you get into longer stories, and things get really bad. Dark Tower 
The first book, great. Yes. The rest of them were awful. I also thought Dark Tower was just so self-indulgent. It's like Stephen King just threw the kitchen sink in. He thought, oh, that's a nice idea. Let me put it in the Dark Tower series. Let me put myself in the Dark Tower that's, series. That's the problem with Stephen King's writing, is he doesn't end things. Like, I got, to, I got to the end of the Dark Tower series, and he literally told me. He literally told me in a, in a brief paragraph before I read the ending, don't read the ending. I did not like the writing this ending. This ending is terrible. I'm like, wait, what? Well, thanks. I'm not going to read the book then, dickhead. Don't, don't read them. They're bad. The Dark Tower series is bad. Because, like, okay, the brief moment with uh, Blaine on the train, Blaine is a pain. That was, that was great. Blaine was great. It would have been a great self-contained story. But he threw in every idea he could think of, and he finished none of them. Yeah, it's like he just has to sit down and commit. And I think that's the great thing with short stories is, as I've, I've written a couple myself, a couple published, is you have to fucking commit to a short story. Because you don't have the time to explore ideas, and the reader doesn't have the patience for ideas. They want one thing executed well. Yeah. And I think, yeah, that's where horror shines, because you don't have to sit down explaining it, and you have to resist every single temptation to explain, to roll about, to lord up. Story, and then you're out. Yeah, there are a bunch of short stories that I read from my youth, my youth, I say. I'm not old. Anyway, when I was young, I read a bunch of short stories, and a lot of them have stuck with me. There's one that I really liked where a kid goes to visit his uncle. His father drops him off. Okay. And he tells him when he drops him off, your uncle will tell you. He will tell you one lie while you're there. Only one. Your job is to figure out what the lie is. And the kid goes to hang out with his uncle. And his uncle tells him, when you put cinnamon in your tea, the bubbles you see are actually little elves drowning. And the kid's like, okay, that's a lie. But then what he takes him up to look at the stars on the roof. And he tells him, don't look up too high or you'll fall in. And he's like, wait, what? And then his uncle leaves him for a moment. He looks up too hard and he falls into the sky. And his uncle has to catch him. He's like, wait, wait, what? And then he, he hears another one. Uh, the elves. Yeah. And then he goes to unroll one of them, and he's like, wait. And a little elf pops out and runs away. He's like, wait, what? No way. And so he spends the rest of the weekend, and I forget the rest of the things his uncle did with him, but all of them turned out to be true. The story ends by the uncle telling him a story. Oh, I never talk to doctors. I think the kid hurt himself. It's like, I'm here for this. Oh, it's just a scratch. And he proves it by patching him up and he's fine. He says, I never talk to doctors. You see, every person I've ever known only died when the doctor told them they were going to die. Okay. And so then uh, at the end, when is right before his father comes to pick him up, the kid sees a doctor standing outside his uncle's house. Right. He's just standing there, really creepy like, just staring into the house. And the kid looks at his uncle, and his uncle closes the door and tells him, We'll just wait for your father to get here. The kid eventually leaves to go see his father, and as he's letting him outside the door, the doctor comes in. He needs to talk. And his uncle tells him, I'll see you again, son. And when he gets in the car with his father, his father asked him, did you figure out what the lie was? Yeah. He said he'd see me again. And his father's crying and says, yeah. Oh, shit. That's a good story. It's a really good story. I don't remember the title, and I have never been able to find it again. I mean, you're just fucking telling me the story is good. That's how you know it's good. Exactly. It's short. It's self-contained. It's got a little bit of fridge horror in it. Like, oh, what? Well, okay. Yeah. Wow. It's, yeah, it just has me like, I put the pipe down. I took a sip of water and it's like, I just want to think about this now. That's some seriously deep stuff. That, that beats the fuck out of my favorite short story for sure, man. That's just harrowing. If anybody listening to this can figure out what that story is called, please tell me. 
I would love to find that story again. Yeah. Yeah, put it in the comment section. Join our Discord and tell us there. It's like, I I'm invested in this now too. I want to know what that short story was. I remember it. From, I remember the plot from start to finish. I couldn't tell you all of the details in the middle, but man, and that's, that's good. And I just can't find that in these long running stories. Like, I want to know if Luffy ever gets the One Piece. I'm, I'm going to find out what happens with the Corinthian because I do like the Sandman. I want to know what happens in a bunch of other comics and stories. Uh, like reading Sweet Tooth, I wanted to know what happened to Sweet Tooth. You have to be willing to kill your characters. You have to be willing to, quote unquote, kill the story. It has to end. Yeah. Bone ended. It's been ended for decades now. Yeah, 20, 26 years. Yeah, no, I think like the only long form horror story I, I, I read and have legitimately come back to or savored is probably The Road by Cormac McCarthy. And even then, that's not horror in the conventional sense, because it's, it's basically just McCarthy telling a story that could happen, you know, if Yellowstone erupted. Yeah. And even that, it ended. Like, there's no Road 2, Road 2 Electric Boogaloo. It's just, that's it, it's done. And there's so much more that could happen in that world, but Cormac just knew when to put it down. Yeah. Sandman, Neil Gaiman yeah. ended Sandman. DC's bringing it back, but Neil Gaiman doesn't have any control over that. Hmm. Um, yeah, I know. It's like, that, that's, that's the thing. And I think it's also, things have to end at the right time. Because we always, you know, hear about things that have ended too early. Like hundreds of unfinished things or things that just somehow got jammed into an ending, like Bleach, which I think suffers immensely for it. But on the other hand, I think there's also a risk in realizing something has to end and you've missed the golden opportunity to do so. Yeah. If you drag it on too long, it will die. Like, My Little Pony was only ever intended to be a children's show to make money, but yes. everybody will argue about when it should have ended. I'm, I'm not going to give an example of when I think it should have ended. There are plenty of places I could have pointed to. And I'm sure everybody who knows My Little Pony that's listening knows which ones I'm talking about. But we're here to talk about other stuff, not that. Even on that topic of MLP, because that was actually going to be my example for this, is, like, everyone can agree the ending could have been better. Like, yeah. To, to a lot of people, to a lot of people, having questions unanswered is bad. They hate it. That's good. You need to have your questions unanswered. Yes. Because no answer that I ever write, any of the stories that I give you will be satisfying. Yeah, it's, it, that's the thing. It's like what you don't see is more scary. What you speculate about is obviously going to be better because you build anticipation. And I think that's especially true if you revisit something. Because then it's just shit because it's never what you wanted. You didn't even know what you want. Event Horizon, if you ever got an answer, what the hell was in that portal that they opened up, like why it was doing what it was doing, you would, you would hate it. I guarantee it. Yes. Same thing with the briefcase and Pulp Fiction. Yeah. Nothing that you see in that briefcase is going to satisfy you. It doesn't matter if yeah. it was just a pile of fucking gold, if it was pictures of Marilyn Monroe, if it was the answer to life, the universe, and everything. It doesn't matter. Nothing that you see is going to be satisfying. And, th and that's the point. It's a MacGuffin. It doesn't need an explanation. It just needs to be there to make the plot go forward. The MacGuffin is not the point. The characters who are interacting with the MacGuffin are the point. I think audiences miss that. And I think a lot of creatives miss that as well. And then indulge it is, yeah, they just go over things. They have to fill out everything to grind more money out of the series. And that just ruins the original product because you know what the canon is and you cannot escape that. Yeah, now all of your ideas, all of the thoughts that had are pigeonholed. Avatar The Last Airbender in, in Korra, they answered what the Avatar was. That was, I stopped watching around there. You ruined it. I mean, I slugged through Korra and you didn't miss out. You ruined it. Y you did not need to answer that. You absolutely ruined it. They're never going to escape that. I, I hear that the creatives behind Avatar The Last Airbender are going to go ahead and try to do something in between Avatar The Last Airbender and Korra to expand on the universe in a better way. But even then, 
The opportunity is gone. It's gone. You, you've taken the out the bag. The emperor has no clothes. Yeah. I grow ever more appreciative of Wizard of Oz for proving that this is the case. Yeah, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. The moment you do, suddenly he's not the Grand Wizard of Oz, he's just a guy. Like, yep. and that, that raises the question for, is Oz an actual place? Because people have always wanted to know, does Oz actually exist? And it's never been answered in any of the books. And it should never be answered. That doesn't matter. It should never be answered. Somewhere over the rainbow. Third star on the left and straight on until morning. There you go. Through the looking glass. Whatever. Yeah, all of this. It, it, you need that sense of mystery and wonderment in the world. And the second you let, like, I'm not even going to blame, like, franchising or, you know, capitalism. That's an easy way out. It's just integrity integrity the, the second you don't finish the story at the right point that wonderment dies the world is hell and it just sours the taste like tom Waits said the world is hell and bad writing is ruining the quality of our supper if we're going to suffer have a good time doing it don't explain everything yep. because you don't need to you only need to explain what is pertinent to the story you are telling Make me ask questions about the plot in a good way so that I'm wondering, well, what happens next? Ask me that. It's like, okay, well, maybe there's something else. Where does this magic come from? You don't need to know. You don't need to know where the magic comes from because it's not pertinent to the plot. Just know that this wizard can cast Fireball and he's going to use Fireball to stop this other evil wizard. Yep, that, that's all you need to know. You don't have to build more stuff into it because I think... Honestly, readers, well, any people who consume media are generally very forgiving with it. Yeah. But we're not stupid. Yeah, th this There's this a difference. is part of Show Don't Tell in Death Stranding, if you've played Death Stranding. Briefly. In the intro cutscene, you meet Fragile, and she just throws a bunch of different terms at you. Doom, um, time fall. All you needed to do in that intro cutscene is show me that, oh, it's raining. Main character gets out of the rain. He needs to get out of the rain. So he gets out of the rain, and then he has a picture. Part of it is in color. Part of it is in black and white. The part that is in black and white has had the rain falling on it. He reaches out to grab it. He gets burned. Perfect. Okay. The rain is bad. Oh, you need to know. You've done a good job so far. And then he sees footprints coming at him through the ground. Holds his breath. Okay. Footprints. He needs to hold his breath because the footprints are going to find him otherwise. The footprints get really close, he's struggling to hold his breath, and then the footprints go away, and he can finally let go of his breath. Good, good, okay, there's demons he can't see, but he can hear them and see their footprints. And he has to hold his breath, stay away from them. Excellent, good job. Then Fragile shows up and throws a bunch of terms at me that I don't need to know. Bad, bad. I didn't need to know all of that yet. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's it's thinking the reader is stupid, so you just dump all the stuff on him instead of letting him think, okay, how can I figure this out? What can I infer? And yeah, you might be wrong, but you build a working knowledge of the world and you actively participate in the story. Exactly. And answering questions is the opposite of that. Yeah. In Hagwarters, the, the Hagwarters can travel through mirrors. You don't need to know why. I don't care yeah. why. Just I could. Magic Dolp travels through mirrors. Yeah. Par for the course. They can do that. You don't need to know why. That Maybe that'll get answered later. I'm not going to say yes or no. Maybe it'll get answered. But if it's not pertinent to the story, you don't need to know yet. Why are there hags? You don't need to know that. There are hags. There just are. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. The hags are the problem. The problem of why there are hags is not the problem. Hag orders go and kill them. That's it. Yeah, that's all you need to know. And I think on that note... We might have to end this podcast before it turns into a franchise. <laughs> Best to kill it while things but are thanks good. for coming on, Max. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. It was a good time. Yeah, great talk. I mean, obviously, check out Hagwarders. And on that note, as always, this has been the Unreal Press Podcast. Today I've had on Waxworks to talk about comics and why you need to end them at the right time. And you know, I've been L.A. Love Shane. I've smoked a pipe of pretty terrible pipe tobacco, rum and maple. We are not sponsored by Rum and Maple. We actively condemn it. And so, yeah, until next time, we'll see you then.
thanks for coming on. And so yeah, let things end, kill your darlings, and keep the people asking good questions. Cheers. I may have gone too far in a few places.